Hi everyone, and welcome to today's IT Bro Today webcast, Don't Get Spooked by Ransomware Threats with the Right Data Protection Strategy, sponsored by StorageCraft. If you have any technical difficulties during today's session, please press the Help widget on your player console to receive assistance in solving common issues. If at any time you are having audio difficulties or issues with advancing of the slides, please hit your F5 key to refresh your webcast console. Today's web seminar is being recorded and will be available on demand for 12 months starting tomorrow. You will receive an email when it is ready. And with that, let's meet today's speakers. Michael Krieger is a 40 plus year technology and marketing veteran with managerial and executive experience in IT, product management, product marketing, research, and analysis. In 2008, he founded MRK, a San Fran Bay Area marketing consultancy that focuses on technology, legal, and biotech products. Sean Darrington is a Senior Director of Product Management at StorageCraft and has more than 20 years of storage experience. He has held multiple product marketing and management positions covering storage management, cloud, and virtualization solutions. And with that, the floor is now yours, Michael. Thank you so much, Jen. Uh, happy to be here. And uh, we're going to talk about the rise of ransomware. I'll start off with a little overview about ransomware in general and how cybersecurity uh, as a whole has evolved over the past few years uh, since ransomware has become the dominant force in uh, and cybersecurity challenges, why criminals have turned to ransomware, how it spreads, and we'll talk about the ways that the payloads detonate, and of course prevention, what you can do to make sure it doesn't happen, and if it does happen, talk about what the cure is as well. So, you know, what is it really that we, we worry about when we're talking about ransomware? The risks, of course, are uh, number one, the loss of your data. Um, if your data is encrypted and you can't get access to it, that also can lead to downtime. And as we know, downtime costs money. It could lead to the theft of your intellectual property, and it can be actually considered a data breach from a regulatory perspective, which is critical for um, protected data such as PCI data or HIPAA, what have you. How big is this market? Ransomware is growing at an alarming pace. Um, these numbers uh, that, I, that, that I have are from a couple of years ago. Uh, 2016, there were over 4,000 attacks a day. That's four times what it was in 2015, and the numbers today are even quite a bit larger than that. In that year, over a billion dollars was paid in ransomware, which was up fourfold from the previous year. Um, the statistics are pretty shattering. Um, last year, from a billion, it went to $8 billion. All of this is a result of the evolution of cybercrime from kids having fun, can I take down that computer, war games kind of stuff, to organized criminals. The business of malware is organized crime. Ransomware went professional in 2013, and as I said, it's now an $8 billion a year of business. Coveware, their quarter two ransomware marketplace report said the average ransom payment had increased 184% from the first to second quarter of this year. That's almost doubling in a quarter, nearly tripling the cost from $12,000 to $36,295 per incident, according to stats that were released just this summer. As for the, uh, the impact in downtime, the average downtime from ransomware is nearly 10 days. The second and even more expensive cost of a ransomware attack is that total cost of downtime, which is typically five to 10 the actual ransom amount, and measured in lost productivity, slack labor, lost revenue opportunities. According to Forbes, the cost of a data breach on average was $3.86 million in 2018, up about 7% from the previous year. And the average cost globally for each lost or stolen record containing sensitive and confidential information is also up from last year, landing at about $148 a record, uh, which is about a 5% increase from the year before. So what's the reason for being? The number one reason, of course, is money. Uh, ransomware, uh, these are organized criminals. They're out to get your money, and they'll get it um, either by stealing your information, or through the ransom payment. Sometimes it's revenge, avenging a perceived wrong. 
There are nation state actors who use ransomware for competitive advantage. Uh, I'm writing a book about that, so I'll be sure to share share that with all of you when that comes out. And uh, did I mention money? It is really ultimately very simply all about one thing. Show me the money. Um, ransomware is spread by a number of ways. Phishing emails look legit. They entice you to click or download attachments. It could be through a drive-by download attack on a compromised website. Uh, often you see shotgun approaches targeting an entire email list of an enterprise instead of um, uh, one individual. It only takes one click needed to launch. Um, it reminds me of that uh, Southwest Want to Get Away commercial, with the, the pink slip virus you may remember. And uh, Interestingly enough, I'm sitting here uh, looking at my wife who is working in my office today. About um, just a couple of weeks ago, she came in uh, home from work and she said, I did a bad thing today. I said, okay, let me hear it. Now, she, like me, is a longtime IT veteran. She is now an office manager for a local company, and she was uh, needed a printer driver for the office printer. And instead of going to the printer vendor site, she just did a Google search, started downloading a driver, and about 15 seconds later, her IT guy came screaming into her office saying, shut your computer down now. Um, it had, um, uh, she had found some malware site and was in the process of downloading it. Fortunately, that their antivirus uh, captured that at the time and, and prevented it from happening. So uh, I will talk about a little bit uh, later what the most important thing is to prevent ransomware, but it's, it just goes to show that education and, and making sure that we're all uh, keeping the people element out of it is, is the most important thing. So how does it work? Asymmetric public key cryptography encrypts the victim files using a public key that's generated from the ransomware computer, and that computer holds the private key, which is needed to decrypt the files. So once that's done, simply demand payment, and then go on and repeat. And is it effective? Uh, yeah, absolutely. If once that system is infected and that malware gets to deploy in the system, um, kiss those files goodbye unless you've prevented it. So what are the key methods of preventing uh, ransomware? Number one is training and awareness. Um, as long as people are not doing those silly things, uh, clicking on the wrong email links, downloading drivers from unreliable sources, that's the number one thing. Email security is, again, critical. Anti-malware uh, obviously should be in place. Just as important is identity and access management. Uh, ensuring that your network is secure, that you don't have open uh, Wi-Fi available that could be used to get in there, that only authorized people are getting access to your systems, that employees who are terminated or rapidly removed from the direct directory. All of these are just as important because obviously a disgruntled employee can very easily wreak havoc if they have access to the right things, as was made evidently clear a few years ago when the city of San Francisco had its uh, IT servers locked down by uh, a former employee. Um, with a number of mobile devices that uh, users are utilizing today, mobile endpoint security is just as important as the devices that we have in, in the premises. So um, since everyone is using every device, be it a tablet, uh, a smartphone, or what have you, to access corporate networks today, ensuring that those devices are secure and they're not compromised is just as important. And part of that could be as simple as segmenting the ne network to ensure that casual users of the network are not accessing vital systems and that systems are segregated in such a way that an infection in one area doesn't bring down the entire organization. Uh, of course, monitoring and, man and management of all of those um, is just as important to all of the above to make sure that if something does happen, as happened uh, to my wife the, uh, the other week, that it's rapidly, um, a rapid response can be uh, taken to solve that issue. So finally, when all else fails, oh, well, there are all these great job boards you can look to, and um, seriously, to talk about what happens when prevention fails and you ha actually have to remediate uh, a ransomware attack, I'll turn it over to Sean Derringen, who's going to talk about the rest of that today. Go ahead, Sean. 
Great. Thanks, Michael, and, and welcome, everybody. Um, yeah, it is, as Michael set the stage, it's, uh, it, it's really a question of not if somebody's going to be infected. It's a question about when, and that's kind of the mentality that you need to take um, as you look at this for, from a perspective of how are you going to protect your data. Um, so what we want to share a little bit today was what StorageCraft is doing about this problem. So StorageCraft overall, you know, we look at, at how do we secure customers' data for not only just storage and, and, and unstructured and file access for primary storage, but also the entire business continuity spectrum, right, including data protection as well as the ability to recover any system, whether it be from a ransomware attack or another type of failure in uh, in the cloud. And so as you look at the portfolio, and I'm going to focus on, for the most part, OneSafe. Um, OneSafe is our converged scale-out storage offering. Uh, this incorporates uh, the scale-out storage capabilities for unstructured data or structured data for VMware uh, environments, but also is a converged data protection solution. So this is a full opportunity to back up VMs, physical servers, even desktops in a converged fashion where the data protection software is actually running on the cluster. It's actually running on the nodes in the cluster and coordinating with the applications that need to be protected. Uh, this is a complete solution that customers can start with a um, handful of terabytes and grow to petabytes of capacity based upon uh, their needs and the size of, of the company. Um, additionally, for either remote or branch offices or for smaller deployments, uh, ShadowSafe is the same SLA-based data protection offering that's included in the OneSafe Converge solution, but this is a software-only deployment model. Uh, you can use this with just internal storage to your server, or you can use it with third-party storage. Uh, if it's a smaller deployment, you can even use this as a software-only and have OneSafe as the back-end target. So there are lots of different deployment options you have for either the OneSafe with the full converged storage and or data protection capabilities, or a software-only deployment model uh, with ShadowSafe. Uh, in both cases, depending upon how you'd like to protect those applications, either on-premises uh, or in the cloud, you can actually replicate them to our cloud and have full DR as a service opportunities to recover that uh, VM or physical server to provide not only the data recovery, but the application and networking services back to your uh, customers on-premises. Uh, we also have the opportunity to replicate backup jobs to third-party cloud providers like Amazon or Google. But if you want to look at a coordinated and full DR as a service opportunity, that is one of the things that, that we offer. Now, as you look at OneSafe, and I mentioned earlier that we're going to focus mostly on OneSafe because that's really where you can have the full protection against ransomware depending upon the type of infection that you may uh, encounter. Uh, it is built upon uh, a different storage architecture. So as you think about this, you have to think about things differently uh, when you're looking at solving this problem. Uh, and fortunately, we have a unique scale and architecture that affords you a number of opportunities to protect and recover that information. So unlike the legacy storage solutions uh, that have been in the market for you know, 30 plus years since the invention of RAID, it's, it's not built on a block store, right? So LUNs and volumes, all that the legacy solutions have used in the past really don't scale and support the needs of the future. Uh, what we've done and StorageCraft has actually uh, built our own and written our own content addressable object store, or distributed object store. So for those of you on the phone that are familiar with object storage and you know Amazon S3 and the notion of, of gets and puts and buckets, that same approach of thinking about a pool of storage can now be applied to something you can deploy on premises. Uh, and as we've d built our object store, we've actually put on top of it, instead of requiring RESTful APIs, uh, it actually requires simply NFS or SMB. So we look like scale-out network attached storage from your application's perspective. However, you get all the benefits of object storage, and I'll get into some of those benefits in a moment. Um, but those objects uh, are really something that we can move around anywhere we need to based upon a particular event. So if you're thinking about, if you look at the top right where you see the microservices, uh, we have file system access to the object store, but also the data protection, right? This is the converged data protection I mentioned on the previous slide, or two slides ago, where you can have a scale-out cluster and a pool of storage that can be used for multiple purposes, both file system access for your users and home directories and archiving and video repositories, uh, VMware, um, VMDKs and NFS data stores, but also a data protection capability for physical and virtual servers. And all of those microservices have equal access to the storage, 
All those microservices have inline deduplication, compression, encryption at rest, remote replication as an option to protect that information because as that information is being written, we're decomposing and ultimately we're managing objects and those objects are immutable and that's an important factor when you're thinking about how do you protect against a ransomware infection and how do you recover in the event that something unlikely but sometimes unfortunately likely does happen uh, with an infection there. So there's a couple different deployment options as you look at this. Uh, OneSafe certainly can be used for primary storage um, and this, can, this is a way to protect not only and store for virtual environments but unstructured data, uh, as I mentioned earlier, file serving. A lot of uh, organizations, healthcare organizations, use this for um, fax imaging or uh, the file repository for the nurses and the doctors that can be accessed uh, from anywhere in the hospital. Additionally, um, dash cam, body cam, et cetera, those types of, of files that need to be written and oftentimes can exceed the storage capacity and how you can fit those backups in a win uh, ha fit the backups of those files in a given window, you have that opportunity to leverage the object store to simply scale out and grow that cluster as you need to. Now you also have the opportunity to use either the same cluster or a different cluster depending upon physical location uh, of the one or multiple data centers you may have, is to actually look at converged secondary storage with data protection. So now you're not only having the primary storage on one safe, but you can actually be protecting the physical and virtual servers to the cluster. And this is again where the data protection services are actually running on the cluster, so it's a very efficient communication protocol between how do you get the data from VMware onto OneSafe. Um, that happens all over RPCs and, and very efficient uh, data transportation. Now this first two scenarios that I described here for deployment options, these are all on-premises and that's perfectly fine to do, but in some cases, uh, depending upon the types of applications, you actually want to get that off-site for business continuity and disaster recovery. There, you, again, you have a couple different options. Um, in the lower right, you see that you can replicate a OneSafe cluster to another OneSafe cluster. Um, and if you have multiple data centers and you have the ability to recover VMs yourself and coordinate that, that's fantastic. Um, if you want to leverage third parties, you can register uh, and coordinate with StorageCraft's cloud for our cloud services and how you can recover applications in our cloud. Or you can have just storage replicated to Amazon or GCP or Azure or others, right? Um, these are all different options that you as an organization have based upon the tiers of your applications that you're protecting and what type of service level objectives you'd like to actually have for those applications in the event of recovery. Because as you look at this, what we have is the opportunity to protect applications uh, based upon service level agreements or service level objectives, right? So based upon the number of VMs, you can choose the types of storage that you want to use as a backup target and the types of performance that you want to have delivered to those applications either for um, you know, primary storage access or as a backup recovery target. We have a lot of organizations that leverage the all flash one safe array uh, and that cluster to actually provide high speed recovery. So now in the event of an application recovery request, you're not recovering from a hard drive based system, you're actually recovering that critical application from an all flash. And so now your all flash recovery target is performing at the same level as typically your primary storage would for VMware as an example. So this is a good opportunity to take a look at how do you want to define the services that you're going to deliver and protect those applications and how are you going to choose the appropriate storage hardware on the back end type but also scale out over time so that as you grow from 10 terabytes to 50 or from 50 to 100 or 100 to 500, you don't have to reconfigure your backup jobs. As you scale out and add more storage over time, you're simply increasing that pool of storage and all the applications that saw 10 terabytes on the left side now see 100 terabytes in the middle there. Right? And the same is true from the backup recovery perspective. You don't have to re you know, reconfigure your jobs or add different storage destinations, you simply just add more storage and the one safe scale up cluster just increases that pool of storage that's available to the applications. There are no forklift upgrades. Um, whether you're adding storage and growing from 10 to 100 terabytes, that's all non-disruptive. Um, or you're at the end of that hardware life cycle in three or five years from now, you can simply proactively evacuate some of the nodes from the cluster, add more new nodes based upon the new hardware. And now that pool of storage is exactly the same but just unplug the old hardware. And again, your applications and users and backup jobs don't know that anything has changed. 
So that's actually, uh, you know, obviously a, a clear benefit from an operational side where you can choose what type of service level you want to deliver to the applications, how you can grow over time as your business needs change, because as we all know, we don't have perfect crystal balls and things will always change. Um, but then also, how do you get the information back quickly to your users? And that's where Virtual Boot, this is actually a patented technology that StorageCraft has, allows you to begin recovery of any VM or physical server uh, in less than a second. And this is something that is, as I said, unique to StorageCraft, um, but you can actually do a hyper restore. And this is something that the VMs that are running on, let's just use VMware for now, uh, VMware, they're being backed up to one safe cluster on the right-hand side there, right? They think that for the most part, they've been accessing the VNDKs in the primary storage and take your pick of vendor, whether it be a one safe or whether it be pure or um, EMC or others, that VM that you just recover, you can begin to do that in just a couple of mouse clicks. And I've got a screenshot there on the left side for one system that you can see a little bit about how you can choose a recovery point and where you're gonna recover that VM from. Once you begin to do that virtual boot recovery, what happens is that the VM that's running on VMware now, you don't have to spin up another pre-built VM or anything. It's literally, we do that all in the background. It thinks it's still accessing the primary storage. However, we're redirecting all those IO requests to OneSafe. And as that VM needs it from the beginning of booting to beginning of running the application, that VM thinks it's accessing the storage from the primary location when in reality, we're doing a recovery of that data in the background. So now that VM is getting exactly what data it needs over time, and we're delivering that directly to the VM. At the same time, we're recovering that data back to the primary storage there. So when you're done accessing and recovering that 500 gig VM or whatever capacity it might be, the VM never knows that anything really changed. However, in the background, we've recovered all that data from OneSafe back to the primary storage which eliminates the extra step of another storage vMotion from the recovery point to the primary storage as some of the other competing solutions do. Right? Um, this also works for not only the on-premises recovery that I just described, but as you see there on the top, the cloud storage, if you have a failure of a, of a VM and you recover that in our cloud, for example, uh, you're running that application in our cloud providing the data and networking services back to your users in your data center. Now, that's great for a failover scenario. Well, how do you typically get the fail back from a cloud provider back on to your premises? Right? And that's where this virtual boot can actually work from, in a similar fashion, from the cloud back to your location. Um, and when you're done with that, you're, again, your VM thinks it's still accessing the primary storage, and it makes that seamless transition for not only the failover, but also the fail back uh, from an operational perspective goes smoothly. So that's virtual boot. That's actually one of the patented things that we have uh, that is, is fairly unique uh, in, when you look at the entire solution that we have. Now, this has really been, I've been focusing initially on the data protection side, right? How do you set an SLA-based policy? Uh, how do you, in a number of clicks, define which VMs you want to uh, protect, how many snapshots you'd like to keep for hours, days, weeks, et cetera? The other side of this is the unstructured data side. So with OneSafe, we actually take continuous snapshots every 90 seconds of the file system. So those scenarios that I mentioned between PAX imaging or hospital information or dash cam, body cam, unstructured data, map network drives for users, et cetera, all of that file system access for the unstructured data, we're actually taking 90 seconds, every 90 seconds we're taking a snapshot and we're keeping those 90 second snapshots for an hour. Then after the first hour, we keep hourly snapshots for the first day and daily snapshots for the first week and weekly snapshots forever. So now on a share by share basis, coming back to the service level objectives, you as an IT administrator can actually decide how long you'd like to keep those snapshots. Do you wanna keep them for a week, a year, three years, forever? Um, you can decide on a per share basis how you'd like to do that. All the snapshots are actually deduplicated against the primary storage. So obviously it's very space efficient, there's some metadata overhead, but if you don't have a lot of transient data where you're writing a terabyte of data, deleting it, writing a new terabyte of data, your capacity consumption is gonna be minimal if you want to keep snapshots for a longer period of time to enable you to recover as close to the infection as possible. Because keep in mind, even though you may have a ransomware infection on day one, 
a lot of times that those ransomware infections will lay dormant for a few weeks. And we've seen this with customers already. Um, uh, customer in Hong Kong had their backups uh, infected uh, as well as the primary storage, but it laid dormant for three weeks. Um, their retention period was uh, two weeks. Um, and so they wound up with a one week gap of the exposure. Uh, now fortunately we were able to work with it and they found the issue beforehand, but that's a scenario where you have to think about how long you want to keep the snapshots based upon your ability to provide that perimeter fence and actually detect that something has changed and you've actually been infected with ransomware. Um, the other key thing with, with the snapshots for the unstructured data is that the snapshots are actually immutable. Coming back to our unique architecture, the distributed object store is an immutable object store, which means that any data that's written is protected for the life of the snapshot. Uh, so if you write out 100 gigabytes of data and ransomware comes and infects one of your users' PCs and that encrypts that 100 gigabytes of data that was on the PC, we're going to write out that 100 gigabytes of encrypted data. However, based upon the snapshots, that original data is also going to be there. And unlike other volume-based snapshot technologies, uh, our snapshots cannot be turned off. The snapshots can't be modified. They can't be deleted by any user app, app any user action, or any application, right? Um, and ransomware has actually become intelligent enough to actually do this with many of the VSS-based snapshots uh, that are out there. And so, as you look at this, because of the one safe snapshots that are immutable, you're going to have that original data to recover from. So now the question is, how are you going to do that? And if a ransomware attack does occur, um, the snapshots, as I mentioned earlier, are unaffected, uh, so you can actually recover those. Uh, and you have a couple different ways to do that. I've got a screenshot here in a second, but what, if it's just an individual file recovery or folder, your users can just right mouse uh, Windows previous version, right? Um, however, for the larger issue, if, it, if a ransomware infection goes out and it infects an entire map network drive, now it's no longer a 100 gigabyte or a couple hundred gigabyte recovery problem it can be a 100 terabyte recovery problem, right? And so this is one of the things that is available, um, will be coming shortly with OneSafe, is the ability to instantly clone a share and rec or recover from a given snapshot at a previous point in time. Uh, and you can recover that entire share, regardless of the capacity, even if it's up to 100 terabytes or even if it's 300 terabytes or 500 terabytes, it doesn't matter. You can recover that entire share in less than a second. And that's, again, because of our unique architecture. Uh, that object store that we have underneath the covers, it delivers all the benefits of being able to scale out non-disruptively, uh, evacuate old hardware from a cluster before you want to add new or vice versa without any disruption to the applications. It gives you that ability to protect all of your data with immutable snapshots. It gives you the ability to clone multi-terabyte, hundreds of terabytes of a share in less than a second. And that means that now your applications can reconnect to that new share after you rename it, obviously, but you just reconnect to that new share and you just did a restore of 100 terabyte file share in less than a second, right? And so based upon that previous point in time, you determine when that ransomware infection occurred. You go to the prior one, you can view those snapshots, you can view the files there, you can see that they're not encrypted um, as that file extension, and you can do that recovery uh, in a very seamless uh, and easy fashion. And this is actually one of the things that's very advantageous, and we have a lot of uh, companies that do this, even from this perspective of individual file recovery, right? Um, many healthcare organizations that they have to obviously comply with HIPAA and other regulations. But as Michael was saying, ransomware is on the rise. The attacks are very sophisticated. They're also targeting more and more businesses. They're also targeting healthcare verticals, in particular, because every healthcare organization, they have a dollar per record exposure that they have to pay in fines if that information is compromised. And so every ins every hospital has an insurance policy to underwrite that, right? And this is actually one of the ways that we've had customers justify the purchases of their of OneSafe as a complete solution for on-premises and replicated to another OneSafe because it actually decreases their insurance premium because everything is encrypted, number one. Number two, they can recover from any infection because of the continuous snapshots that we enable on the cluster, both primary as well as remote. And so now they can actually justify to the board a solution that starts at less than the cost of Amazon S3 storage, 
for complete protection against ransomware. And in the event that they are infected and have been breached, now they have multiple ways to recover that data, either through the data protection of the VMs and physical servers, or if it's from the primary storage of the unstructured data that's stored in OneSafe, they can do the right mouse windows previous version that I'm showing here, or they can clone that share from a previous snapshot um, as I was just describing as well. So there are multiple ways that you can recover from an infection, but take heed in terms of what Michael was saying up front is you certainly have to have the security and the perimeter defense for the, uh, the intrusion and de um, the intrusion detection, malware, et cetera, education of your employees. But if that does not go far enough and you are infected, with OneSafe you have actually multiple ways to recover that data on premises as well as in the cloud. And this is one of the things that a number of our customers, I was mentioning the healthcare organizations and underwriting their insurance policy, but there are also other agencies that use this for uh, legal matters, right? Obviously health and, and legal firms, but this is actually a couple of customers, Camden County Prosecutor's Office uses OneSafe for the evidentiary data repository. Um, so as their, as their lawyers are storing their case files, um, you know, if they have to go to trial, if the judge has a request for a file, it can't be, I don't have it, right? At the same time, body-worn cameras and dash cam repositories is very well suited for OneSafe in terms of being able to store and protect that information because as you look at how many officers and cars you may have, that can be, in this case, they have 300 terabytes deployed. You can't back up 300 terabytes in a traditional sense, right? And that's where they rely on our snapshots and remote replication to protect that information. The other benefit to this in terms of our object store is not only all the deduplication and compression and encryption, remote replication, and immutable snapshots I was describing, but because it's an object store, that data is actually protected from other types of failures that can happen with hard drives. Uh, undetectable bit error rates or bit rot where a traditional LUN or, or volume-based solution, it could return corrupt data just based upon the hard drive not behaving. Forget ransomware, forget that infection, but just from a hardware failure. And because we're an object store underneath the covers, everything is a hash value to us. So we can actually guarantee that the original data written to the cluster is what we're delivering back to the application. And that's important when you look at evidentiary data repository or body cams and dash cams. At the same time, here in California, one of the large uh, law enforcement agencies, they actually store similarly evidentiary data repository, but this is also for all the crime scene investigator information, right? So this is for the state of California. They have to be able to scale out as caseloads expand, as additional information is stored. They need to be able to do that, uh, obviously, non-destructively and seamlessly, but then also have to be able to protect against any type of failure, uh, ransomware included. And so these are a couple of uh, agencies here that, that obviously uh, are, are highly regulated, uh, but looking for a very critical storage to protect their critical information from something that people have to plan on actually happening, right? And that is a ransomware infection. Um, I'll give you one last, there have a couple questions. Actually, before I go to the last slide, a couple questions have come in here um, in terms of, uh, uh, number one, how large of a, how large can you scale the cluster to be? Uh, you mentioned hundreds of terabytes. Yeah, so, there are a couple answers to that. Uh, one is we have the um, OneSafe, has, there's an all flash version of OneSafe, and each OneSafe uh, is up to 32, 38 terabytes of all flash capacity, and you can scale that to seven nodes in a cluster. Um, similarly, we have hard drive based models. Uh, the 4417 has 200 terabytes of raw capacity in a 2U form factor, and that can also scale to seven nodes. So you're looking at a raw capacity of about 1.4 petabytes. Um, depending, on the, depending upon your protection level, uh, that can be between uh, four and 700 terabytes of usable capacity. Um, those scalability uh, requirements I just mentioned in terms of having the number of nodes in a cluster, that will be increasing uh, over time as well uh, to 14 and 21 nodes. And now this will be via a software uh, upgrade and you can just non-disruptively non -disruptively, uh, add more nodes uh, over time. Uh, there's a question here uh, about uh, tiering snapshots to the cloud or older snapshots. So uh, for the data protection piece, when you're defining that service level about how and where you want to protect that information, those, um, the backup recovery points are actually on multiple destinations and you can choose local, uh, remote, and or cloud. 
And so the, the same um, recovery points are in those multiple locations. Uh, for the snapshots within OneSafe, um, since all the snapshots are actually deduplicated, if you replicate that to another OneSafe cluster, the snapshots are also replicated. So you have the same replication history in terms of which shares are replicated, as well as the snapshots and the recovery points are the same on the source and on the target. Um, you can, with that, with the uh, what I was mentioning before about being able to recover or clone a share from a snapshot, if you wanted to separate a share and have that just sit at the remote cluster and uh, you can clone that share and just let it sit idly by and so you can keep longer term snapshots. In this case, to think about the longer term share with its snapshot as an independent share on the target. So you can clone shares and do it for that purpose. So that would be how you would accomplish that uh, for that question. Um, question here about how far back do you know to look for a good snapshot. So um, let me jump back to this slide here. Um, you can navigate the snapshot history through Windows Explorer or if it's an NFS export through Linux and the snapshots are actually time-based and so you'll see the date and timestamp on that and once you look into that snapshot you can see the file extension. Anytime you see a normal file extension it's clean, um, you'll see different file extensions if it's actually uh, an infected file uh, with, with ransomware. Uh, and so that's the, easy, that's the way to find it and then from there then you can clone that share as of that recovery point and everything is recovered. Um, so um, there's a question here about protecting uh, uh, OneSafe in hybrid or multi-cloud environments. So OneSafe uh, is deployed on-premises today. Uh, OneSafe doesn't run in AWS or Azure. Um, so as you're looking at protecting applications on-premises, you can do that to OneSafe. If you're looking at protecting applications like O365 or GDocs, I didn't mention that too much here. But you can, ask, actually, you can actually do that as well, and you can protect your cloud-based SaaS applications uh, in the cloud. Um, and so if you have applications running uh, in the cloud, uh, you can protect the Office 365 and GDocs. Uh, for OneSafe and the applications on-premises, um, that's how you protect those. Um, another question here, um, can you do multiple fail backs uh, if a backup is infected? Uh, yes, okay, so two parts to that. Uh, so if you have the data protection, the converged data protection capabilities, and you're going to recover a VM from yesterday at 1 p.m., and that recovery point, after you do that, you find out that that's actually still infected, yes, you can go back and recover from two days ago at 1 p.m., or the, a previous snapshot of the ba a previous backup recovery point, which is in VMware's terms a snapshot, uh, you can recover from that way as well. From the one safe and the unstructured data where you're cloning a share, uh, you can do the same thing. So that primary share that you're cloning from a, a different recovery point, once that's cloned, that original share is still there until you delete it, right? And if it's not a good recovery point, you can go back to a prior one and clone that share from that different recovery point. So good, all good questions here. Um, there's another question about uh, remote replication. Do you have to replicate to like clusters? Um, so, uh, so this is uh, when you're replicating one safe to another one safe uh, at another location that you have, they do not have to be identically configured. Um, this is again a benefit of, of object storage is that think about a pool of storage. You don't have to think about a capacity per share anymore. You can replicate a five node petabyte cluster to a three node 300 terabyte cluster if you want to because on a per share basis you're determining how long you want to keep the snapshots or if you want snapshots on at all, and then do you want to replicate that from your source to your target? And you can do one-to-one, -one, one to many many-to-one. So that architecture about how you want to replicate is very flexible, as well as you only have to have enough capacity on the source and the target to do the replication. You can replicate from a five-node cluster to a three-node cluster. You could replicate from a three-node all-flash cluster to a five-node hard drive-based cluster. It doesn't matter. The same software runs on all OneSafe models. It's just a question about how quickly you'd like them to run. So you can support, we do support heterogeneous uh, remote replication between those clusters. Okay, all good questions here. Um, let me uh, jump to the last slide here. And uh, one last example with uh, MIT Plasma, Plasma Science Infusion Center. Um, MIT, these guys have been, uh, MIT's been a client uh, for, for years, uh, three, four years now, 
And they had the issue, number one, for those that don't know about what Plasma Science Infusion Center does, which is, I'm sure a lot of people, it's not intuitive, their charter for the researchers and students is to actually recreate the energy of the sun. And so they run tests and experiments to generate fusion power to use for, you know, companies or individual, right? They're trying to solve the energy problem. And that if you can recreate the energy of the sun, that's a very good start. And so what they had on the left-hand side there was originally, over the years, all the researchers would buy a small storage device. And when I say small, it could be 10 to 50 terabytes. But they would buy a small storage device, and they would figure out how many experiments they needed to run over a three-year period, the capacity per experiment, and they would try to size that over a 36-month period to get the job done. Well, when they filled, when their researchers filled up that storage as, over the years, more job, more research was taking up more capacity, so they ran out of space. And so they had this storage island problem, not only for the research applications, but for the backup of all the VMs that are running um, the, the MIT, that department within MIT. So what we worked with them on is, let's consolidate all this into a single cluster. So they have all the research applications and all their backups going to a single cluster. So as over the years, they've needed more storage, they simply add another node to the cluster and they're adding 100 terabytes at a time, or they're adding 50 terabytes. Um, but all of that storage capacity is just a pool of storage. And so if the research applications are consuming more storage than they had expected, but the virtual servers that they're backing up, in this case they actually use Veeam, is backing up to the cluster that is not consuming as much, they're okay because all that storage is used across any application that needs it. So they don't have, to, they don't have silos anymore. They have the ability to protect all the research from ransomware infection. They can go back to just even a deleted file by um, a professor or a student, right? They can go back to that previous version and recover it. Um, obviously, ransomware is an extreme example that they're able to do. But even if it's just file corruption or just accidental deletion, they can get that information back. So that's actually something that is, uh, is, was very advantageous for them. And over the years, they just simply scaled out and added more storage as they needed to. Um, so uh, there's one last question here that's come in. Um, I'm just reading here. Files corrupted. Uh, so the uh, the question here is with the file extensions being able to see that a file has been infected via snapshots. Do we do anything to provide the alerts to you as a as a customer? Uh, at this point, we don't. There are things I'm looking at uh, in terms of being able to determine the rate of change of a file system or if there's a bulk rate of change within a folder or a share to provide some of those alerts and notifications for that. Um, that's definitely one of the things that, um, that we're, we're working on to kind of take this recovery uh, to the next step is that if you can detect it sooner rather than later, you're going to be able to remediate and reduce your exposure. Uh, even if obviously you are infected, and we just talked about a number of ways you can remediate that exposure. Um, but that is one of the things to become more uh, intelligent about uh, and looking at the analytics side about what's happening on the front end and making recommendations about what you should, what actions you should take. But great question. All right. Um, so uh, with that, let me turn it back, uh, Michael. I, I think you had there were a couple questions here for you as well. Um, I'll let you take those. Thank you very much. Let me uh, get into the Q and A. So. Um, one of the questions that I had was uh, about um, um, actually I, I think all the questions that we got to were already answered so I'm just going to turn it over to Jan oh okay great okay great all right well it looks like we do have a few extra minutes left um, Sean or Michael, do you have any wrap-up thoughts that you'd like to leave with the audience today? Well, I think Sean brought, brought up a lot of great points here in, in um, the way that this needs to be approached. Um, th this is going to happen for uh, almost everyone. I see a question from someone who just got attacked by ransomware um, a couple of days ago. Is there any quick way to see where it may originate? And it, there isn't a quick way to find out, unfortunately. Every uh, type of ransomware, they all use different... Um, um, uh, algorithms and they use different cryptography tools so um, it is possible to uh, isolate the type of ransomware that was used but to say where it came from um, not so easy because of all the different um, ways that it could be downloaded 
um, what what that leaves you with is you, know, you need a remediation plan. It's it's not enough just to be able to say, yeah, we've done all this to protect our data. At some point, you're going to have an incident, and and to to do that, you need some way of going back in time. You need a time machine that's going to go back to when you last had good data. It's all about you know the the recovery point the recovery point that um, data is good, um, and like you know everything else we've talked about data protection probably for the last two decades the issue is getting the shortest possible rpo and rto you know how far back do we have to go okay here's where the last time the data was good and how long does it take for us to get um back up and running and um obviously if you can work from that other snapshot and um, have that appear to have been restored already onto the primary storage um, that's you know you're, you're approaching that that um, RTO of zero that every IT guy is looking for. Okay, Sean, great. anything well, you'd that's... like? Yeah. 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 The only thing I would I would add is I, I, you have to think about things differently, right? Ransomware mm -hmm. relatively new. It's not something we've been dealing with for decades, but it's not something from yesterday. It's definitely accelerated its its focus, its intelligence, and its ability to morph and penetrate sophisticated perimeter defenses, right? So you've got to think about things differently. You also have to think about how you're going to manage storage and data protection differently, both in context of ransomware, but then also just overall. And so taking a different approach and looking at what you can solve on-premises, replication to another site, uh, but then also some of the, the different approaches for storage, right? The one safe in our object storage architecture is not what everybody's used to, right? There are no LUNs and volumes, and so it's a different way about managing things. It's all, mm -hmm. also a simpler, more powerful way to manage things, but it's one of those things that if you're, if you're approaching a problem that you think you know the answer to with the, with the same solutions that have been used in the past, chances are you're not looking at the entire picture. So take a step back, look at the bigger picture, and this isn't something that you can, well, most organizations, most IT organizations have the bandwidth to take everything on at once as a big project. So pick parts of it, start to approach it, and, and have a one to two year plan to get there. Um, but take a step back and think about how to solve the broader problem. Yeah, I mean, 20 for 20, Century storage products aren't going to solve 21st century data protection issues. I think that's what it boils down to, right? So, uh, yeah, real intriguing stuff here in in terms of this uh, distributed object storage approach. I think this is this is the future of storage in in a you know in a yottabyte world. Okay, great. Uh, well, thank you for that uh, kind of summary for the audience. Um, it looks like we can give everyone a few minutes of their day back. But before we go, we'd like to thank StorageCraft for sponsoring today's event, as well as Michael and Sean for that great discussion. Just a reminder, this seminar will be available on demand starting tomorrow, so please feel free to come back and review. Have a great day, everyone, and thank you for attending.